Hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I am your host, uh, Sean Needham, along with my producer, Lindsay. Today we are streaming from wonderful Post Falls, Idaho. You know how I love Idaho. Liberty in Idaho. Loving it. So today we have a very, very special guest. All of our guests are special. I'm super excited to have this one on today for sure. He's been in the news a lot lately. He's been on Laura Ingram um, a couple times, been on Glenn Beck at least once um, all over the news. He came up back in, oh, it was either, it was early in this COVID pandemic thing, um, either in February or March, I saw him on Laura Ingram show. And he, he is a doctor in Minnesota, also a state senator in Minnesota, and recently another grandpa. Congratulations, Dr. Scott Jensen. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Sean. It's good to be with you. Yeah, thank you for being on. It's it's such an honor. So we will um, definitely honor your time today. I know you have a busy schedule because not only are you a senator and you've got all kinds of media stuff going on, you are still a practicing doctor. And thank you for everything you do. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you, Sean. Okay, so let's just get right to it. I, I think that when I first when I first uh, was introduced to you on the Laura Ingram show um, during the the first this COVID pandemic, you were talking about COVID and hospital incentives for reimbursement. Can you talk a little bit about that now? Well, what actually happened was the Minnesota Department of Health sent out a communication regarding how to complete death certificates in the environment of COVID-19. And I said, this isn't right. They were introducing a certain amount of ambiguity and utilizing terms like, well, if you think it's probable or you assume it's COVID-19, go ahead and put COVID-19 as the death certificate. And generally we've been held to a higher standard than that. We're held to a sequence of causation. And if something uh, potentially contributes to the death, there's a separate area where you can put that. So I raised a bit of a ruckus on the Chris Berg show on April 7th. And I think it was the next night I was asked to be on the Laura Ingram show. And in that show, we started talking about the coaching and the encouragement to use COVID-19 as a cause of death. And in that process of conversation, I mentioned to Laura that there's a, dis, a differential if you do diagnose COVID-19 in regards to what hospitals are reimbursed for Medicare patients. And basically hospitals are generally reimbursed a lump sum for a Medicare patient stay. That does not include physician reimbursements. But if it's a, typically, if there's a diagnosis codes for a respiratory infection or a pneumonia for a Medicare patient, the hospital will receive about $5,000 whether or not the, hospital, the patient stays two days or four days. But if they code it as a respiratory infection, COVID-19, the reimbursement is increased to $13,000. And if during the hospitalization, a ventilator is used, then the reimbursement is $39,000. Wow. And the, the USA Today did do a fact checking on me in late April, I think. And they came out and said, yeah, Doc Jensen from Minnesota is right. We did fact checking and it's true. Those reimbursement disparities do exist. Wow. Wow. So that being said, doctor, do you believe there are a lot of death certificates out there that might not be completely factual when it comes to a COVID death? I think there may be. Yeah. Yes. And I think that we saw Pennsylvania pull a couple hundred people off of their COVID-19 death count. We saw Colorado do the same thing. We saw Kentucky do something similar. We saw New York go the other direction when New York City decided that they actually were going to count deaths that hadn't necessarily been attended to at the time. They had some 3,700 deaths, and they decided that because that was the differential in terms of all-cause mortality from prior years comparison, that they would count those as COVID-19 deaths because what else could they be was the assumption. So New York City, I think, went from, or New York State went from 7,000 at one time to 10,700 overnight. And that would make me concerned that they might've been taking people that died in an apartment of a sudden heart attack and said, well, this is COVID-19. 
because they did not require that there be any positive laboratory confirmation done. And in many situations, there had never been a test done. There had never been a test even considered, but it was still identified as a COVID-19 death. So it does make me nervous that we might be, if you will, erroneous in some of our death certificates. And I think most people are acknowledging that there probably are some errors. Whether or not the overall effect is to be undercounting or overcounting, I think is still a matter of debate. Yeah. And that might explain because um, New York's numbers um, seem to be extremely high, even based on, you know, their concentration of population density. Um, their numbers seem to be extremely high. And that might explain a little bit of that. So thank you for clarifying that and educating um, our um, viewers on that. So go ahead. Something else that you might find interesting is that within a few weeks after some of those numbers were moving so rapidly, some of the congressmen and U.S. senators from both New Jersey and New York were advocating that their states should be receiving a larger share of CARES, the the federal program CARES dollars, because they were experiencing the burden of COVID-19. They were dividing the number of COVID-19 deaths by the number of dollars they were getting. And New York said, well, we're only getting $12,000 in the CARES Act for each COVID-19 death while a state like my own Minnesota, because we had a low count with COVID-19, we were getting $300,000. So if people want to tell me that dollars don't matter, I'm not buying it. Uh, Oh my goodness. So as usual, Dr. Jensen, follow the money. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm so glad that you are um, vocal enough and have enough guts to stand up and are educated on this subject that, that you can tell, tell people the truth. So speaking of speaking out, um, maybe because of you speaking out, um, you've, you've had a complaint against your medical license. Is that correct? I did. At the end of June, I received a letter from the Minnesota Board of Medical Practice identifying that they were investigating me for two allegations that had been turned in. Uh, I was not allowed to know who my accusers were, but I was being advised that by some of my public comments and my willingness to question on TV the Department of Health's recommendations regarding the use of COVID-19 as a cause of death, that I was spreading misinformation. And on another uh, allegation, I was accused of reckless advice because I was willing to compare COVID-19 to prior influenza epidemics and pandemics. Wow. So one of the things you mentioned in that, um, during that investigation, when it first happened is you said, you know, if this could happen to me, this could happen to you. So explain what you mean by that. Well, thanks for that question. When I was comparing COVID-19 to influenza outbreaks, I'm not saying they're the same. I'm saying that they're both single-stranded RNA viruses that present with an incubation period and a latency period and have similar symptoms, and we see these kinds of things routinely. When I compare COVID-19 to influenza, I'm not doing anything that Dr. Fauci doesn't do. In a New England Journal of Medicine article in March, Dr. Fauci was the lead author of an editorial that basically said that the more we learn about the COVID-19 outbreak, the more it was behaving like a severe influenza outbreak. And one of the contributing authors was Dr. Robert Redfield, the head of the CDC. So I felt that that was really unfair to accuse me of providing reckless advice when I was doing nothing more than what many physicians and leaders around the country are doing. And then in regards to the allegation on the misinformation regarding death certificates, it's clear that many states have realized that they were not doing it accurately. In many states, Coroners and medical examiners have stepped up and told the governor, we are not going to allow this death certificate to go through as a COVID-19 death because this is not a COVID-19 death. In some situations, it might have been a motor vehicle accident. In one situation, it appeared to be alcohol poisoning. So I think that for me to experience that kind of personal attack, and just a few years ago, I was named the family doctor of the year in Minnesota. Good for you. I think... If, if someone can take the Minnesota Board of Medical Practice and turn it into a weapon whereby they can use it to try to muzzle me, then I think that anybody that has any kind of certificate or license, whether you're a nurse or a teacher 
or if you're a hairstylist, if you have a regulating agency through which you must keep your license or certificate current, it's conceivable that someone could turn in a complaint regardless of how bogus and they could affect your life and conceivably cause your business to suffer. Absolutely. And, you know, it really hit home with me, Dr. Jensen, because my wife and I are both pharmacists and we own a pharmacy in Washington State. And, you know, we do things a little bit different and we're pretty vocal about it. Um, And some people don't like that. So we've had to fight complaints just like you have. And you're right. I think some of those agencies have been used as weapons and they use our licenses. Um, You know, they they dangle it in front of our face that that's something that they can control. And it is very scary. Um, I actually had a Cuban immigrant who was a doctor, Dr. Raul Garcia, on my show a few weeks ago. And he talked about how in Cuba, one of the things that they did to control his mother was they took her nursing license, they took her teaching license, and that's what governments use to control um, people. So I appreciate you getting the word out there. And when you say, um, you know, if this happened to me, this could happen to you, it's true. And all of us as healthcare professionals should be worried about that. And I think that we should, you know, I'm glad that you have a different opinion as somebody else. I'm glad you spoke your opinion. That's the only way that we progress in science is that somebody has a different idea or a different opinion. Um, What do you have to say about that? I think that question is so critically pertinent that I think you should keep asking that question of everybody that you interview regarding these topics. For instance, Let's just momentarily talk about hydroxychloroquine. Whether or not it's going to ultimately prove to be a real help in COVID-19, I think remains to be seen. It certainly appears that used in the second or the critical phase, the advanced phase of COVID-19, the data has not been encouraging. Nevertheless, there have been places where when it's used earlier in the disease, perhaps in the outpatient population, there may be some value. I don't think that issue has really been settled. But we've had many states, and Minnesota is one, where the governor has come out and basically told the Board of Pharmacy not to fill, not to dispense the prescriptions from doctors for hydroxychloroquine unless it's an appropriate diagnosis. The underlying implication being that an appropriate diagnosis would be to use it in regards to malaria, prophylaxis or treatment, or lupus, or rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, let's follow that reasoning. Let's go down the rabbit hole on that one a little bit. Why don't we have the governor and why don't we have politicians tell us when to use ventilators? We found that in New York City, when they had their surge, that ventilators weren't nearly as useful as they had been thought to be. And so what happened was instead of a 40% fatality rate, which is somewhat routine on ventilator usage, meaning that when you go on a ventilator, this is a critical step and there's a darn good chance you might not come off it. But instead of 40%, we found that 70 to 80% of people going on ventilators were not able to get off and indeed died. So what happened? We rethought whether or not the ventilator usage was what we thought it would be. Low flow oxygen and other measures were utilized instead. Did the government step in and tell us when and when we would not use a ventilator? We have budesonide and dexamethasone steroids that have been identified as potentially being helpful. Is the government tomorrow going to tell me when I can use budesonide and that I shouldn't dare to use budesonide in a situation that they don't approve of? This is unprecedented. This alone should cause everybody to not sit in the spectator seats in the arena, but get in the arena, get bloodied and bruised and engage the issue, just like Teddy Roosevelt said so many years ago. We cannot afford to sit quietly on the sidelines. This is big stuff, and our rights are being taken away from us. Absolutely. And, and, and here's one thing we have to remember. I mean, thank you so much for those words. Those are very, very powerful. And you are obviously an expert on this subject. You have done a lot of your own research. You're a doctor, and you you know about this stuff. You've treated these patients. But here's the thing that we should be concerned about. Maybe, maybe some people don't care about COVID-19, as popular as it's been all over the United States. But if they can do this with COVID, they could do it with any disease. And how would you like, viewers and listeners, for your doctor's hands to be tied if they have a treatment that could possibly help you and the state or federal government starts deciding 
that they can't do that even though it's going to help you. That's very scary precedence. And like like Dr. Jensen says, this is unprecedented times when the when the government starts telling doctors how to practice medicine. Very scary. We all need to be worried about this and speak up about it. So go ahead, Dr. Jensen. I agree with you. I was just going to provide a very straightforward example. Physicians are, and I don't mean to be boastful, but we're relatively bright people. We may not have as much common sense as we would like to have. Oftentimes, we're good at chemistry and biology and physics. And I think sometimes we're not very good at fixing a can opener or that doohickey thing in the toilet. But we are pretty And if you look at what we did with aspirin, we had recommended aspirin for primary prevention of cardiac disease for years. But we kept watching. And we saw that we were actually not getting much bang for the buck. And so what we did was we looked, are we hurting people with aspirin recommendations to take an aspirin a day to keep the doctor away? And what we found was that we were causing a lot of GI disturbance. We were causing more GI bleeds than we were saving heart attacks. That's why several years ago, we came out and said, we can no longer recommend a baby aspirin a day if you've never had heart disease. It wasn't because the government helped us out. It was because we did our double-blinded studies. We did our randomized control trials. We wanted to know. We have a tremendous scientific curiosity. And we don't need politicians and academic intellectuals and bureaucrats telling us how to practice medicine. What we need is an open and honest relationship with our patients. And when government decides to fracture the relationship between patients and physicians, every patient in this country should be motivated. Absolutely. And, and the, you know, that, that's a great example because aspirin is an old drug, been used for many things for many years. And you're right. We've been telling patients, you know, uh, aspirin a day to prevent cardiovascular um, events. And that's what's great about medicine and science is that, you know, we use different opinions and different examples until we find out what's right. And if we... If we start listening to the government to tell us what the gold standard is um, all the time, the patients are not going to get the best care, and we will never progress. We'll never progress beyond that. So thank you so much for that. Um, so speaking of what the governor said about prescribing hydroxychloroquine, is that correct? The governor said – was the governor told the State Board of Pharmacy that pharmacists couldn't dispense it? Is that correct? That was a proclamation from the governor? It was an executive order about two weeks ago, and it was sort of sneaky the way they wrote it because they weren't clear. They, they told the Board of Pharmacy, they didn't talk to physicians, they told the Board of Pharmacy not to fill prescriptions for hydroxychloroquine without an appropriate diagnosis. Now, what does the word appropriate mean? Right. We use off-label medications all the time. All the time. I use Flomax not just to shrink the prostate of a man so he can pee easier. I use Flomax in men and women to see if I can help the muscle in the ureter, which is the tube connecting the kidney to the bladder, in an effort to help kidney stones pass on their own mm -hmm. spontaneously, if you will, so that a patient doesn't have to go through a procedure. Now, is that an appropriate diagnosis? I think so. Is it an indication from the FDA? No, it's not. So when the governor says appropriate indication, does he mean that only those indications that are tried and true and identified as FDA approved indications, such as malaria, rheumatoid arthritis, or lupus? Or does he mean appropriate in my eyes as a physician? I don't think it was a very straight up executive order. Fact of the matter is, it rankles me. But this is damn politicians, and this is exactly what they do. Instead of being clear, they put an executive order out there, and if you're not going to be clear, then why bother? Right, right. And, and you know, being a pharmacist, I mean, this hits home uh, big time because, first of all, that puts a pharmacist in a horrible situation. And, um, you know, to put a pharmacist in a situation like that between the doctor and the patient is just is, – is, is horrible. And 50% um, of all – drugs we prescribe every day is is for a non-FDA approved indication. So you're right. What is appropriate? Well, I'll tell you what I think is appropriate. I think if the doctor and the patient decided it was appropriate, then it's appropriate. That's what I believe. Sean, I called a pharmacist that I've worked with for 30 years 
the other day on the phone. I said, if I write out a prescription for hydroxychloroquine, 200 milligrams twice a day for two weeks, are you going to fill it? And she said, probably not. Yeah. And I said, why? You've never done that to me before. And she said, well, it would set a precedent. And you could just tell by the way she was hesitating and sort of stammering that she didn't want to go down that pathway because she did not want to be on the government's radar screen. Of course so not. So what's happening is that, that close-knit relationship that I have with many pharmacists, and let me be clear, I've been a power, powerful advocate for pharmacists being allowed to work to the top of their license in the four years since I've been in the Senate. Pharmacists can and should be a big part of the solution as we go forward in terms of trying to control the cost. I was the chief author in the pharmacy benefit manager bill in the, US, in the Minnesota Senate that we got passed last year. I think that we need that close relationship between not just pharmacists and physicians, but we need to strengthen the relationship between pharmacists and patients. Patients benefit in a real way from pharmacists. And that's why I'm leery of all these mail order pharmacies because they're not there to walk the patient through some of their questions. Absolutely. So it really bothers me. Well, thank you for standing up for pharmacists. I really appreciate that. And I agree. And when the government puts barriers in between patients and pharmacists or patients and, and doctors in the pharmacist relationship, uh, that's where patients start to suffer. And I don't blame that um, pharmacist um, for doing that. I mean, because in, in theory, her license is here again. We can go back to this. Her license is um, you know, obviously valuable to her, and the government can control that. And that's a very scary thing. Very scary. So we all need to stand up for these things. Thank you for standing up for, for pharmacists and healthcare um, people in general, Dr. Jensen. So um, Minnesota is personal to me. Um, my wonderful wife, um, Janet, has a mother that's in an assisted living facility. In, um, her name is Lillian Dahl. She's in an assisted living facility in um, Minnesota, and she is basically in isolation. Her kids can't see her. Her family can't see her. They, you know, I, I, I can't imagine just um, from my perspective that that is good for the elderly. Um, you have some patients in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. I, I hear Dr. Jensen. Can you expand on that? One of the lasting legacies from this pandemic, when we get through this and we get on the other side, is going to be how horrific our policy decisions were in regards to long-term care facilities. If someone has six months of life left or three years of life left, who are we to tell them that they will live it in isolation, regardless of their decision, regardless of their choice, regardless of their needs? For many of the patients I have in nursing homes, their greatest need is not Lipitor. It's a hug. Yep. It's human contact. Amen. And the notion that we have locked down our nursing homes and then create a pipeline of active COVID-19 disease into the long-term care facility and then tell the nursing home residents, by the way, you will not be able to be in direct contact with your loved ones. And if you get COVID-19, or if your other medical problems worsen, you're on your own. You will be left alone. Staff people will be coming in, but this is the way it is. This is barbaric. Absolutely, absolutely. It gives me chills to even think about it. It's amazing. I, I never thought in my lifetime we would see something like this. Um, so what are your thoughts about um, opening up the economy then, you know, opening up um, during this? What, what are your thoughts? I believe that the diseases that we don't see on those nifty dashboards all over America and all over the world are far more destructive than many intellectuals and bureaucrats and politicians realize. We have seen a huge uptick in mental health issues alcohol usage, depression, suicide rates, suicide attempts. We have got to put this in context. We cannot tell people that they don't deserve 
to be able to make a living, that their business isn't essential, that their business can be shut down with a signature from a politician. We do not need more lockdowns. We need a laser focused approach to take care of those people who are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. Yeah. And we have learned much about COVID-19. We should be thankful that our young people have been spared, that in many areas, the case fatality rate for people under the age of 40 with COVID-19 is statistically zero. This is a wonderful thing. Bottom line, lockdowns are not the answer. We need to be laser focused instead of sacrificing science at the altar of fear and playing some sort of crude whack-a-mole game and, if you will, pushing science aside. So I thank you for that. Um, I, I agree a hundred percent. We need to, we need to move on with life. So, um, what are your thoughts about wearing masks out in public? Speaking of science. I believe that in regards to masks, the best data we have to look at will be the first two decades of this millennium. In other words, from 2000 to 2019, right now, anything that's being generated is being generated so quickly and with such a pre-existing expectation and conclusion as to what the experimenter wants to see. We can set up our own experiments to make it look like masks work or like they don't. Yep. But if you look at data from 2000 to 2019, there was a strong consensus in the scientific community that masks did not prevent or effectively filter respiratory viruses like influenza or coronaviruses to a significant level whereby people would be protected. We know that N95 masks have capabilities that cotton and surgical masks clearly do not. If we look at the actual pore size of the cotton and surgical masks and ask for those pores, that porousness of the mask to block the 0.1 micron COVID-19 particle, that's much akin to putting a chain link fence around your yard in the hopes of preventing gnats from getting in. <laughs> right. It makes sense from a physics standpoint. Right. But yes, there's some blockade of some COVID-19 particles. But the question is, are we sacrificing the ability to keep our hands away from our eyes and nose and mouth with masks? I see people every day and they're constantly touching their face and fidgeting with their masks because they're not used to it. So, I would say that the mask question in many states, including Minnesota, has been settled because of executive orders, not because of pure science, and that it's more of an emotional decision and a sense that someone's taken the high road in terms of social responsibility. But for me, I don't think it's data driven. And I think that we're going to have to wait until we get on the other side of this to once again return to actual science to settle these questions. That makes a lot of sense. So yesterday was a big vote in the Minnesota Senate and the Republican caucus to remove the emergency powers that the governor has put into place. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, as you might expect, all the Republicans in the Minnesota Senate voted to remove them. And I believe there was one Democrat that did. In May, as we brought our regular session to a conclusion, I believe on May 18th, I had the original amendment, excuse me, the original bill to remove peacetime powers. And I wanted to have us vote on it then. I submitted the bill, but at that time, in deference to those who weren't certain that this was the right thing to do, and that maybe it was too soon to remove the governor's peacetime powers, we did not take a floor vote then. We have during each special session now. All right. So it looks like for now, then you guys are still under the emergency powers of the governor. And I think people need to understand why, Sean. The reason is because, and the, and the governor knows this full well, he's got a substantial majority of Democrat voters in the House of Representatives. And the only way his peacetime powers are removed is for both the House and the Senate to vote to remove them. And the fact of the matter is the Senate has voted three times to remove them. The House has not voted to remove them and won't 
because this governor has made it very clear that he will use the power of his office to bully his Democratic legislators if they don't play ball his way. He will call them on the carpet and has and tell them it might be a cold day in hell before you get a bonding project in your district if you don't stay with me. Right. People need to understand it. This is law politics and it's not going away. And Governor Walls has proved himself to be very adept. So when are you running for governor? <laughs> I'm pleased to show you that I had my sixth, I, I was blessed with my sixth grandchild yesterday. Congratulations. And her name is Logan. Awesome. Let's all get up. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, Dr. Jensen, I so appreciate you being on our show today. I am so honored to have you speak. You're obviously very well educated on the subject of COVID-19. And thank you for fighting for liberty, um, your patients, um, other healthcare providers. Uh, it's, it's great that we have doctors that can speak out about this, even if they don't agree with the mainstream um, narrative. So I really appreciate it. Thank you for being on. Um, let's please keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, you've been listening to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Um, stay tuned for our next show Monday, 1 to 2 p.m. We'll be streaming live um, Pacific Standard Time, 1 to 2 p.m. See you Monday. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.